Okay, so today we're going to talk about DNA structure and gene function. So what is DNA? DNA is a molecule of nucleic acids. Uh, there are five different types of nucleic acids. We'll see that in a second. Um, and this is essentially a polymer, which means you have a bunch of these nucleic acids linked up together. It is made up of many monomer subunits called nucleotides. And DNA stores the information that the cell needs to produce proteins. It is your genetic information. So how did scientists discover DNA? Well, it was by what we call Griffith's experiment, showed that some unidentified substance in a lethal strain of bacteria could transform a harmful strain into a lethal strain. Later, it was discovered that DNA was transmitted between the toxic and the harmless bacteria. Hershey and Chase showed that DNA, not proteins, containing the genetic information. And they showed this by viruses using DNA to change cellular genes. So DNA is actually composed up of nucleotides and each nucleotide will consist of one phosphate group shown here, one molecule of uh, deoxyribose sugar, which is a five carbon sugar shown right here, and then a nitrogen base. And for DNA, there are four nitrogen bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. The nucleotides will join together in strands of DNA. The nucleotide sequence of DNA is the order of the nitrogen bases in a strand. And what you can see here, but we'll talk about this in a second, is DNA molecule is actually double-stranded. And here's one strand, here's the second strand. The two strands are referred to as anti-parallel to each other, which means they are actually going in opposite directions. Instead of reading DNA left to right, we actually read it what we call five prime to three prime. So here's the five prime to three prime direction here. And here's the anti-parallel strand going in the opposite direction. The fact that it's double-stranded is referred to as a double helix, and one DNA molecule is made up of two strands of nucleotides. The two strands wind together in a helical shape. DNA strands are held together by base pairing. Hydrogen bonds form between the nitrogen spaces to connect the two DNA strands. And adenine will always bond with thymine by two hydrogen bonds. Guanine will always bond with cytosine with three hydrogen bonds. Here you can see G and C with one, two, three bonds, A and T with two bonds. This is always going to be the base pairing too, A with T, G with C. The DNA strands are referred to as complementary. Hydrogen bonds can only form between complementary bases, meaning a can only hydrogen bond with T, G can always hydro only hydrogen bond with C. The nucleotide sequence in one strand determines the sequence of another strand. So for example, if you have a T in this strand, the complement strand has to be an A. If you have a G, the complement strand has, I'm sorry, if you have a C, the complement strand has to be a G. So that's how you figure out the complementary strand. As I mentioned a few seconds ago, each strand of uh, DNA are anti-parallel. Each end of the DNA strand is different. You have the five prime end where the phosphate groups attach to the deoxyribose. And you have the three prime end where the hydroxyl group is attached to the deoxyribose. The strands are anti-parallel, which means they are oriented in different directions as you can see here by the arrows in the picture with one upside down with respect to the other. So protein production, which is essentially the entire functional components of cells, starts with DNA. A gene is a small region of a chromosome. The sequence of DNA in each gene encodes for a specific protein. Now that we've talked about DNA, let's talk a little bit about RNA. 
RNA is a nucleic acid as well. The differences between RNA and DNA is the sugar. Instead of being deoxyribose, which is what we see in DNA, the sugar is ribose. The difference here is in this carbon, you have a hydrogen for deoxyribose. And in the same carbon for RNA or ribose sugar, you have a hydroxyl group. The nucleotide bases are also different. You still have adenine, cytosine, and guanine, but instead of thymine, you have what's referred to as uracil. Uracil replaces thymine. Generally, DNA is double-stranded. RNA is generally single-stranded. The function of DNA is that it stores RNA and protein encoding information and transfers information to the next generation of cells. RNA carries protein encoding information and it helps to make proteins um, and can catalyze some reactions as well. So in this case, uh, protein production will occur in two stages. Transcription, which occurs inside the nucleus, and this will synthesize the RNA, specifically the messenger RNA. Translation is going to be uh, the taking of the messenger RNA transcript and reading it by an organelle called a ribosome, which will synthesize the amino acid strand and that will generate the protein structure. That occurs in the cytoplasm, um, either on a free ribosome, or it occurs on the rough ER, which is studded with ribosomes. So transcription is the process of RNA synthesis. Transcription uses DNA as a template to produce RNA. The nucleotide sequence of DNA determines the nucleotide sequence of the RNA that is transcribed. RNA sequence is complementary to that of DNA. Translation is protein synthesis. Translation takes place at the ribosomes, and there are three types of RNA that interact with each other to carry out translation. The first is messenger RNA, which brings the information. The second is ribosomal RNA, which makes up the ribosomes. And the third is transfer RNA, which will bring the amino acids uh, to, to the ribosome uh, to link up to form a protein strand. Transcription uses DNA to create RNA. Let's first look at how cell produces an RNA copy of a gene. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, transcription is a process that occurs in the nucleus of the cell. So to make RNA, base pairing takes place between RNA and DNA. DNA will pair with the RNA. And in this case, adenine will pair up with uracil because there is no thymine in RNA. Cytosine still pairs up with guanine. Guanine will pair up with cytosine. And the DNA does have thymine that will pair up with adenine in RNA, okay? It's still base pair complementation here. So the process of transcription occurs in three steps. We will look at these steps one at a time. They include initiation, elongation, and termination and release. Transcription initiation, this is when the RNA polymerase gets started. RNA polymerase, which is the enzyme that will synthesize the RNA strand, binds to a promoter region, which is sort of a sequence upstream that the enzyme will recognize. This indicates the beginning of the gene. RNA polymerase will also unwind or unzip the two strands of DNA. Transcription initiation, DNA is the template. The DNA template strand encodes the RNA molecule. The other strand does not participate in transcription. The elongation step, the second phase of transcription, RNA polymerase is going to synthesize the DNA, I'm sorry, the RNA strand. 
So RNA polymerase moves along the template strand, making an RNA copy. And as you can see here, wherever you had a C, you're going to generate a G. Wherever you have a G, you're going to generate a C. Wherever you have an A, you're going to generate a U, so on and so forth. The RNA nucleotide base pair with the template strand. The RNA polymerase will join them together in a strand of RNA. The three prime end of RNA matches the five prime end of the DNA strand. The third phase, which is termination, RNA polymerase will reach a terminator, which is a region of DNA found at the end of the gene. At the terminator, the RNA, DNA, and RNA polymerase will separate from each other. The DNA recombines to form the double helix again, and the cell has produced an RNA copy of the gene. RNA is not ready yet. The cell must modify the RNA before it can carry out its functions. A cap structure is added to the five prime end of the messenger RNA. This is referred to as the messenger RNA cap. At the three prime end, you will add what they call a poly A tail. This is the addition of several A nucleotide bases. The cap and the tail will protect the messenger RNA from being degraded. Introns are sequences in the genes that are not used for producing a protein. Exons are the sequences that are. Introns are removed from the messenger RNA. The processed RNA is now a functional molecule. When processing is complete, it leaves the nucleus and then onward to translation. And again, translation is now the process that builds the protein. So now let's look at how ribosomes will use RNA to produce a protein. So we've gone through transcription and we've taken a DNA template strand and we've made a messenger RNA strand. So now we're gonna read that messenger RNA strand and produce a protein strand. And translation occurs by reading what we refer to as codons. Codon is a three nucleotide sequence that encodes one amino acid. All cells, regardless of species, will share the same genetic code, meaning for lysine, AAG is a code for the amino acid lysine. That is the same code whether you're talking about a bacteria like E. coli or whether you're talking about human cells. And we have what's referred to as a genetic code. Uh, and this is the table that's provided here. The genetic code shows which messenger RNA course codons will correspond to which amino acids. The transfer RNA will translate the genetic code. Transfer RNA molecules bring the amino acids to the ribosomes. The transfer RNAs are adapters that recognize the genetic code. And essentially what's gonna happen is the transfer RNA is gonna have what we call an anti-codon, which is the complement of the codon. And that will actually recognize and bind uh, to that structure. Transfer RNA matches up to the messenger RNA. The transfer RNA binds to a messenger RNA codon here at the anti-codon and binds to the corresponding amino acid at this region here. Each step in translation will occur at the ribosomes. Ribosomes help the three types of RNA interact with each other to build a protein. The large subunit binds to the transfer RNA, the small subunit to the messenger RNA. Translation will also occur in three steps, initiation, elongation, and termination. Translation, initiation, messenger RNA is now your template. Small ribosomal subunits will bind to messenger RNA. Large ribosomal subunits will also bind. The initial transfer RNA molecule binds. Its anti-codon matches up with the start codon in messenger RNA, which will always be methionine. So here's your messenger RNA strand, and the codon is AUG. The transfer RNA is going to be the anticodon, which is the complement of that. So the complement of AUG is UAC. 
that transfer RNA is carrying an amino acid referred to as methionine, which will always be your first amino acid. The initial transfer RNA anticolon complementary base pairs with the messenger RNA star codon. The initial transfer RNA already carries an amino acid methionine. This will be the first amino acid of the protein. The second transfer RNA enters the ribosome next to the initial initiator transfer RNA. Its codon matches to the messenger RNA codon. So if we look, the next codon is GGA. The transfer RNA anticodon would be CCU, and that's carrying amino acid glycine. Methionine and glycine, when they're brought together close to each other on the ribosome, are going to form a bond, specifically a peptide bond. The amino acids are joined together when the enzymes in the ribosome form that bond. As you continue, the first transfer RNA now leaves the ribosome, but its amino acid now stays behind. It's going to fall off, but the amino acid is now bounded to uh, glycine. The ribosome moves to the right, and the third transfer RNA comes in. Its anticodon matches up, so we have UGU. The complement will be ACA, which is bringing a cytosine that will bond with glycine. Enzymes form another peptide bond to join the amino acid. The next codon is AAG. You can see the next anticodon, UUC, is coming up carrying lysine. That will shift over to here, and then you'll form a bond between these two amino acids, and so on and so forth, down the entire strand. <clears throat> now, tr translation will terminate. Uh, the release factor will end the process. The ribosome reaches a stop codon, which is at the end of the gene. A protein called a release factor binds to the stop codon. There is no transfer RNA that can bind there. So essentially, the release factor protein binds. No amino acids bound. And what's going to happen is the protein is just going to fall off, and it is assembled. The polypeptide or protein detaches from the messenger RNA and folds into a functional protein. Translation is an efficient process. Multiple ribosomes attach to a messenger RNA molecule simultaneously so the cell can make many molecules of proteins at once. Gene expression is also a highly regulated process. Gene expression requires a lot of energy. Cells save energy by only producing needed proteins. Both prokaryotes and eukaryotes regulate gene expression, but in different ways. Okay, so pro prokaryotes will regulate several genes at once. Genes in prokaryotes are organized into what we call operons. These are groups of genes that are always transcribed together, meaning they're always turned on together. So here we have what's referred to as a lac operon. Um, you have the DNA sequence, you have the promoter region, the operator. And then the genes encoding enzymes that break down lactose are all right next to each other. And you'll make all of the messenger RNAs together at once by just turning transcription on once. The operons will contain related genes. The lac operon includes three genes that will include lactose digesting enzymes. The promoter is the region of DNA where the RNA polymerase binds and initiates transcription. The operator is the region of DNA where the regulatory proteins bind, which can affect the activity of the RNA polymerase. So repressor proteins will block transcription. When lactose is absent, lactose digesting enzymes are not needed. The cell will be wasting energy by producing these enzymes. So a repressor protein will bind to the operator and that will actually prevent the transcription process from occurring. When lactose is present, it binds to the repressor, which changes shape and it releases the operator. And this will end up resuming 
the uh, protein synthesis of the lactose digesting enzymes. Eukaryotes, however, are much more complicated in their gene regulation. In eukaryotes, gene regulation starts in the nucleus. Some genes are wound up very tight and cannot be used for transcription, but other genes are available. Many different proteins called transcription factors can bind to a gene to affect the activity of the RNA polymerase. Transcription of a gene can only occur if the correct transcription factors are actually present. Proteins called transcription factors will bind to the nucleotide sequences in genes called enhancers. RNA polymerase can only become activated when the correct transcription factors are present. Some eukaryotic genes can encode multiple proteins by using different combinations of exons. A process called alternative splicing creates different proteins from the same messenger RNA. So for example, instead of having the sequence of A, B, and C shown here, it could be B, A, C, or C, B, A, or C, A, C. So you can get different alternative splicings. Gene regulation can also continue in the cytoplasm. Certain eukaryotic proteins can hold messenger RNAs inside the nucleus. This will actually prevent them from reaching a ribosome. Some messenger RNAs may be quickly degraded before it is translated into a protein. Other messenger RNAs may be silenced by microRNA, short sequences of nucleotides that bind to the messenger RNA and prevent translation. So proteins can also be regulated. Proteins must be properly folded before they are functional. They must also reach their correct cellular locations. Cells can add or remove chemical modifications to proteins that change protein activity or cause proteins to become degraded. Okay, now that we've talked about transcription and translation, let's talk about mutations. Mutations are a change in the cell's DNA sequence. And mutations can come in several varieties and ultimately they are gonna change the DNA. Just because they change the DNA doesn't mean they'll necessarily change the protein sequence. Um, to explain this, if we go back to our uh, genetic code, that table right here, you can see, for example, for proline, you have four amino acids, four codons here that encode for this single amino acid. So if you had CCU and you end up mutating that U to a C and it's CCC, you change the DNA and ultimately change the RNA here, but you don't actually change the amino acid. So there's really no effect. So a point mutation is one or a few base pairs in a gene. Um, the table to the left uses sentences to show a few examples of point mutations. Uh, so you have substitutions, you have nonsense. Uh, a nonsense would be where you sort of cut off the sequence beforehand. You can have an insertion. You can have a frame shift insertion where you insert just one base pair. And this completely shifts the entire reading frame. You can have a deletion. You can have repeats. So there's many different types of mutations that can occur. Remember that codons are sequences of three nucleotides. Each word in a sentence above represents one nucleotide. So you can see how things change. Nucleotide substitutions can cause small changes in protein structure. Um, only one codon is altered. So only one amino acid in the protein will be affected. But that can actually have severe effects on the actual protein. 
Some mutations can lead to disease. A single base pair change in the hemoglobin gene, which is the main protein found in red blood cells, can form abnormally sick, or I'm sorry, can form abnormal red blood cells, which is referred to as sickle cell. And you can see here is a healthy red blood cell, and you can see a sickle red blood cell just by changing one base pair on the gene. Um, frame shift mutations cause large changes in protein structure and insertion of one nucleotide changes every code on thereafter by, caught by a, what we call a frame shift. Frame shifts will affect multiple amino acids as shown here. And the importance of mutations is that mutations are not always harmful. Mutations can create different versions of alleles, which are alternative versions of the same gene. Genetic variation is important for evolution. Plant breeders even use mutations to create new varieties of plants. So not all mutations are a bad thing. It's also part of evolution. Um, okay, and that's how we sort of arrived at many different species is through uh, mutations. Okay, that is the end of this chapter recording.